Hi, it's Thursday, August the 3rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Mark's gospel. And today we're in Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. That'll finish off the chapter. Um, and all through this chapter, well, we're trying to understand end times. Um, we're going to get into second coming of Jesus. Um, the context is, the way it's framed by Mark, is that Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, basically two sets of brothers, James and John, Peter and Andrew, are um, at the Mount of Olives with Jesus. It's across from, from the temple. Um, and Jesus is talking to them. But, you know, as you're listening, it, it feels bigger. The way Jesus is talking seems seems meant for more than just these four. Um Anyway, what we've heard in the last couple of days that troubles are, are not a sign necessarily that the that the end is near. That's not necessarily what that means. But if the temple is desecrated um, in an abomination, much like described by the prophet Daniel when the first temple was destroyed, uh, then take care, take cover. If that happens, head to the hills, get out of town, um, and that's where we pick it up. So Jesus is still speaking. It's Mark thirteen twenty four to thirty seven. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each one with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all. Keep awake. You got that all figured out? <laughs> oh, kids, I may be out of my depth. <laughs> it's a tough one. Um, I mean, the historian in me, the, 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 the person who's read history, I'm sorry, I'm not a historian, uh, but I have read history and I uh, have some experience with it. Uh, the person who's read history and he goes, well, okay, wait a minute. There's, there's some, there's some issues here. Um, the critical voice in me wonders whether this is Mark speaking, or whether Jesus is speaking, you know, whether Mark has put these words in Jesus's mouth just to, you know, convey them, um, that Jesus never said these things at all. The faithful person in me goes, well, yeah, but maybe Jesus did say these things and I need to work harder trying to understand them. Uh, and if Jesus didn't say these words, yes, but my community of faith for 2,000 years have held these words as holy and found something in them. Uh, and then, of course, the rebel in me goes, yeah, it's good for them. I can find something totally different. <laughs> I don't have to agree with them. Oh, it's so tricky for me anyway. Um, so maybe I just go through it. As, as I read it to you. In those days after the suffering, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven. The powers in the earth will be shaken and then we will see the Son of Man coming in clouds. So this is that vision of the second coming, right? Everything um, is uh, basically shaking. Everything's up for grabs. Everything is falling apart, as it were. Um, the stars will be falling from heaven. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. Those are... Scary words, right? That's things falling apart. Uh, and then the Son of Man will be coming. 
and and it's and it's it's a it's a bigger vision too because there'll be angels and gathers elect from the four winds, the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. So all those who have survived and have been faithful, they'll be drawn in. The saints in heaven, the angels, they'll all be there. It's a great big oh my god event. Now he also says that this generation will not pass away until these things have taken place. But these words are 2,000 years old. That generation definitely has passed away. Now, maybe what he means is when you see the signs, because he does talk about the thing about the fig tree and when you see the leaves, you know. So maybe it's once you see the signs, then you know this big thing is going to happen. So the generation isn't necessarily Peter, James, John, and Andrew. The generation might be our generation if we see the signs which I guess is the stars falling from heaven, the moon not giving its light, the sun being darkened. But I haven't seen that yet. But then he also says, about that hour, day or hour, no one knows. Not the angels, not the sun, only the Father. So much wondering there. So here's how it's going to happen, but nobody knows when. So there's a sequence of events, is it, you know, like... Once we set one thing off, does everything become inevitable? Like, you know, once the moon doesn't give its light, is it the end? You can see how some people, you know, um, when there's an eclipse, get pretty excited <laughs> or pretty afraid. Apocalyptic visions were, were common at that time. And if you think about it, 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 it kind of makes sense. Um, people were uh, oppressed by Rome. Was it the worst oppression in the world? No. Was it fun? No. Nobody likes to be occupied by, you know, a, 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 another country, as it were. No one wants to be part of someone else's empire. In fact, I would say that, you know, if we really sit and think about it, if we really uh, open ourselves up to what Jesus offers us, uh, what Jesus teaches us, the, the, the God that Jesus reveals to us, I think that anybody um, really embracing that doesn't want to be part of empire at all, whether that's being subject or being in charge. It, it, it isn't it isn't the construct that, that, that it is of God, at least as I listen to Jesus, that isn't the construct that is of God. It, it, it's, it's ours. Um, but the point is there are people who are living occupied by Rome, and they're not happy. Um, and I'm sure you've heard it said before, uh, in, the, in, in, in the total existence, the, 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 the decades of, of God, centuries, of the Roman Empire, um, the army stood at peace for like three days. That's it. They were always at war. That well, that's what it was the way of Augustus, right? Uh, you, that, that, that show of force, that threat of war, that's what brings peace uh, to the empire. So they were always fighting somebody. Oh, how tiring. Of course you want it to be over. So there were apocalyptic visions because you didn't see any hope in this time and place. So let's have this time and place end. That would be grand. That becomes trickier for the Western church, particularly um, in, in the 20th century. Um, people talk about end times, but I like the things the way they are. They're working for me. Why would I want to end? So then this, 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 this promise of, 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 of end times uh, becomes a threat. If I don't live faithfully, God is going to wipe all of this out. But I like all of this stuff. So some people hear end time stories one way and others who do not like the way things are, who do not feel free, who do not feel they have opportunity, who feel that they are suffering in all that they do. The idea of these times coming to an end, oh, thank God, that's a wonderful gift. I don't know where you sit in that. I mean, it's easy for us to to look at things. Oh, well, you know, if you're rich, then you're happy with the way things are. If you're poor, then you're not. But it's not that simple. Not that simple at all. I know people 
who I would look at and say, you're not rich. And I mean, you know, statistically, they really live below the poverty line. They struggle, and yet they love their lives. And I know rich people who would just be glad for all of this to end. So whenever I hear an apocalyptic story, I, I, I wonder myself, is it, is it a threat or a promise that I'm hearing? Then why is it that I'm hearing it that way? You know, when, when I hear this, uh, the, these words from Jesus, even though I don't, again, I'm, I'm, I don't know if Jesus says them or Mark is saying them, I don't know uh, exactly what they mean, but I hear in them things that I find um, reassuring, comforting, and helpful. Um, so it, after the suffering, so after the tribulation, so that's after the desecration of the temple, after things have all gone wrong, everything is falling apart. It's not just a human event. It is a cosmic event because the sun is dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling uh, from heaven when everything that can possibly go wrong is gone wrong. Here comes Jesus. So when everything has gone wrong, God is not going to abandon me. God is not going to abandon us. We are not, humanity are not abandoned by God, even if everything falls apart. Now, I know some people who seem to think that's awesome, so let's wreck things so that we can get Jesus to come back and take care of us. I don't think that we're meant to hear it that way or read it that way. But I do know people who do that. But I, I, <laughs> I read their stuff. Uh, I, I hear about the people who are just, you know, boy, oh boy, if we can only... Oh, I forgot what it is. There's a... God, they read the prophecies and there's like a... It's a red cow. And if they could raise this red cow in Israel and it had a calf and that would be a sign of the end times. And so they're breeding, they're doing their best to get that cow, as if somehow, if they were able themselves to produce the cow, then that would force God to do all of these things. Because, you know, once the sky has turned dark, or once the sun is darkened, then all of this is inevitable. It's funny that when we do that, we start to limit God's power. God, if I make this, if I do make this thing happen, then God, you are now bound to do these other things. You can't help it. It's like the mousetrap game when I was a kid. Once that little boot kicks the ball, it's going to go through all the things and you can't stop it. That trap will come down on the mouse. When I read this and I think about those folk, I am reminded that God is not a mousetrap game. And those of you who don't know the game, I'm, I apologize, but I think you get the idea. This idea that we can start something that inevitably must end with something else. It must as if God is bound by those rules. But God, of course, is not bound by those rules. And, and, and that's even in the text about that day or hour, no one knows, it says, except God. God knows, apparently. Um, but we don't, and we can't. And so we don't exert any power over God that way. God's will will be God's will. Now, that opens up a whole theological problem. If I don't have any effect on God's will, then why do I bother to pray? Why do I bother to talk to God at all? Um, why do I bother to listen to God? Because if it's all done, if it's all figured out, then God already knows what kind of a rotten son of a gun I am, so there's no point in hoping for redemption. Although, if I'm going to be redeemed, then God already knows that, so it doesn't matter what I'm going to do because my redemption is already seen by God and guaranteed. You see how tricky this gets. <sighs> and in the midst of all of that, Jesus is saying, keep awake. Why do I need to keep awake? If God knows what's going to happen and God's got it all figured out, then why do I even have to pay attention? I mean, is there a way that if I am paying attention, I can benefit? If I am paying attention, can I avoid a bad result? 
if I don't pay attention, I mean, if I'm not awake 24-7 and I don't see the master coming to the door, am I really punished for that? Because that's, that's a tough one for me because I am a weak human being and I might be spectacularly faithful and aware 23 and a half hours a day. But there might be a half, a half hour where I nod off. I might be perfect for 10 years and then it might be a bad day. Oh, I got a migraine, I'm not paying attention and I miss out. That, that seems very difficult to me. So I, I, I need to balance all of that. I know I'm rambling, but this is a hard piece. So what I take from this, and I think these are the kind of words that Jesus would say, keep awake. So keep paying attention. No, you may not know when the master comes back to the home. You may not know when that second coming is. You may not know when God's presence will be evident, but keep awake and keep looking for it because not only could it happen at any moment, but when we're talking about God's presence, it's always. So keep looking for it. Same way two days ago, we were talking about birth pangs and in, in the midst of these troubles or sorrows, I think is what they called them in the, in the King James translation. Um, but if they think of birth pangs, no, no, no. In the midst of all of this, keep focusing on life. For me, in the midst of all of this, in the difficult times, in the times that are even more difficult than the difficult times, keep awake, keep aware, keep looking for God's presence. Now, Mark may have felt that you have to keep aware of it because if you don't, you won't get in to heaven. You won't get into the party that comes with the second coming, whatever it is. I think that's a whole lot of metaphor, personally. What I do think is I don't keep awake. If I don't keep looking for God's presence, then I am missing out on my life right here and now. And I'm missing out on the very thing that will help get me through the difficult times. I've got to keep looking for life. I have to keep looking for God. But no matter how difficult the times, even a cosmically difficult time, God's not going to abandon me. Jesus comes again. God does not leave us. From the fig tree learns lesson, as soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. When you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. So again, that's like, okay, I'm looking for the signs. That's how I know that God is going to be, that second coming, Jesus is about to arrive again. God is coming. But I also know if I look for the leaves on the branches, then I know that the tree is alive. That's the signs I'm looking for. And if I look around in the world in the difficult times and I see God at work, then I know that God is present. I look for the kindness and the joy. Um, I spent time with somebody yesterday who's who's having a difficult time. Feels is it, it feels at odds with the world. We spent some time together, and I don't think for a second that we solved poverty uh, or world hunger. Uh, I don't think we sorted out the environmental um, crisis that's in, in front of us. No, we didn't do any of that. Absolutely didn't. Um, but I think that we both went away from our encounter being more aware of God's presence. I think in what we were able to share with each other, we both felt God's presence. We had a sense of hope and a way to go forward with God. It would have been easy for me to not look for those little leaves that I found with this, this fellow because I'm not bothered looking for them right now. All I can tell you is that the planet is getting warmer and the storm is getting worse and we're all going to die. Those feelings are real feelings. And they might be well grounded in factual reality. But there are still leaves growing 
all over the place, and I need to tend to the things that I can here. Here is somebody who's looking for um, a holy connection. Here I am looking for that too, and then together we share, and I get to be minister, but we get to be community together, and between us we discover God's presence. Well, if God is present for us there, I honestly can go home at night thinking, and, and, and God is also going to be present with us as we try to figure out how do we live on this planet sustainably, justly, gently. I, I, because I experience God in these little moments, these little leaves on a fig tree, okay, I will be less afraid when the moon does not give its light and the sun is darkened and, and the stars are falling from heaven and because I know that God is present. That's what I take from this. It, again, the context. Jesus is sitting with Peter, James, Peter, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John at the Mount of Olives. So it's across from the temple. You're looking at the temple, which is, as noted earlier, magnificent. It is this incredible structure that gleams in the sun marble and gold and it is like ah and god lives there god lives there right there right across right across the street where we're looking at the temple that's that's sort of i mean I, i'm simplifying but that for 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 first century jews that's the home they built for god this is where they come to meet god this is where they bring god their offerings this is where they exchange with god this is the holy place there it is and jesus is sitting with these two sets of brothers across the street from it essentially looking at it and saying, yeah, see these fig trees? Mount of Olives is known for its fig trees. You see these fig trees? See, look at these little branches. These are signs of God too. Yes, there is a great big temple in front of you. Absolutely. The temples come and go. They're going to go down. It happens. Fig trees? Well, if this fig tree goes, there'll be another fig tree over there. And there's another fig tree over here. And the fig trees move with the seasons. God made fig trees. Man made the temple. So start looking for those things that God offers us in the world. The little things. And when you see them, when you recognize them, then you need to be less afraid of those big things. It's not that you can't find God in the temple. But it's that you can also find God in the leaves on the fig tree. It's not that the environmental crisis that's in front of us doesn't deserve our attention. It needs our attention. Absolutely, it does. But so does this fellow over here who's, who's hurting. And so does the woman over here who's hungry. They also need our attention. And by the way, there are also leaves. They will reveal God. Stop focusing so much on the threat of the end and look at the promise that in the hardest of times, even in end times, God is with us. We're not alone. Keep awake. Start looking for that. That's what I'm getting from this now. I'd love to do a whole thing on whether Mark understands how the Trinity might work or could work. Uh, with some of these words that Jesus says, but that would take me an extra half hour. So maybe we'll come back to it another time. I don't know. But for now, I'm just going to leave it where it is. I'm going to leave it with you to wonder. So let me offer a prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, thank you for your presence in the hardest of times and in the best of times. In these times of wonder, God, may, may Scripture today inspire us to hear your word in this moment. In hearing your word, may we respond faithfully. And may we grow in faith. We pray in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that, folks, is enough for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, until I get to see you, God bless. Um, which, of course, means that God sees you. Right? You know that. And you know that means that God is also with you in the good times and in the hard times. But even more than that, it means that God's love moves through you into the world, connecting you to a world in need and 
and inviting you to see God's presence in the world, to be part of that presence. You matter. That's what it means to be blessed. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.